I love the book of James. I'm soon, very soon here looking forward to um, going to another book to study from, but it's a good book. So let's just read through the, the chapter. The chapters are really short. We'll read through it and then we'll pick out kind of where we're going to be at for the rest of the evening. So beginning in chapter 1, or excuse me, verse 1, chapter 4. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you ask not. You, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you spend it on your own pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility, or in other translations say enmity, towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture speaks to no purpose? He, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's a good one to take note of. Whenever you're prideful, and I know personally, I go in, you know, it ebbs and flows. You know, you, the Lord deals with a measure of it, and then you get back into it, and then you deal with a measure of it. But I really have felt this to be true, even experience, experientially, um, that it doesn't feel quite as near when you're dealing with pride. So in seven, in seven um, submit your full, you, submit therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Well, that's that's encouraging. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So what we're going to focus on is 13 through 17, that last little chunk there. If you have ever read Ecclesiastes, this kind of has a little bit of that feel to it. Especially the first part that says, you know, today or tomorrow we'll do this and we'll do that. We make these plans, um, but really it's futile because we're not in control of anything. And it's kind of prideful to think, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do my plans as if we're in control. One of the things that I've recently be, have been, um, been becoming more and more aware of, I guess, is that whenever I feel in control, it's just an illusion. I'm only in control to the amount or to the degree that the Lord allows me to be in control because I actually have no control over anything except for myself. I, I have no control over things that happen to me. Now, that's not to discount the fact that, you know, you reap things and you sow things. That's not what I'm talking about. But things that happen to you, there are things that happen you cannot control, you cannot stop, you cannot make them happen. They just happen or don't. Um, and so there's, again, there's sometimes a pride issue. We, we think we're in control, but really it's just a, an illusion, or maybe a delusion, depending on how you look at it. And Ecclesiastes talks a lot about that. So if you want to 
look more deeply into that. You can read that on your own. Um, but what we're going to talk about tonight the most is this verse that talks about your life is a vapor. Because I think that's incredibly important. This is probably a message that we could say literally once a week, and it would never not be applicable, never not be relevant, because it's about perspective. We've talked in the past about, you know, for instance, joy, how joy is about a perspective. It's not about being happy, but it's about having, in the midst of any situation going on, having that away from or kind of a God-like perspective, being able to see through his eyes the situation and step back in the midst of the storm to see where we're heading. Um, and that perspective helps so much. And this is the same, same thing, having a perspective to understand that our life is a vapor. So, so question for you. This is not a trick question, and it's not a... It's rhetorical in the sense that you don't need to answer, but I do actually want you to think about what I'm going to ask. So if you were given $10,000 today, what would you do with it? You know, as I pondered the very same question, because um, the Lord kind of posed that to me, I went through a list. I do this and this and this and this and this. And then I start getting down the list. I'm like, okay, actually, I should really do this and this and this and this. But my first inclination, my first reaction was all of it was stuff that had to do with this life that is just a vapor. What am I talking about? So, when we're saved, we are, not, not even when we're saved, let me just say it this way. We are, we are everlasting beings. We're not eternal because eternality is, is no beginning or no end. So we are not eternal beings, but we are everlasting. We had a start. We were born. We were not, and now we are. And, but we will always be. Now, when you get saved, you get to spend that with the Lord. And so the cool thing about being a Christian is that we are actually already in eternity because we are connected through relationship with the one thing that will never change, which is Christ. And that's really awesome. But while we're on this earth, which is literally just a, a vapor, a wisp of smoke, how many of the decisions that we make, and go back to the question about if you were given $10,000 today, how many of our decisions do we make that have any eternal significance versus just the here and now? Like, oh, I buy a bigger house or I buy a car. Nothing wrong with those things at all. But what would it look like to have the perspective that James is talking about? Today or tomorrow, I make my plans, I do these things. And he's saying, no, that's pride. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Did you even consult with the Lord about that? And so he's trying to give, give us a perspective, a heavenly, a kingdom, or maybe even better said, an eternal perspective of the things that we do. Buying and selling, greeting people, buying homes, buying cars, going to work, passing people, having <laughs> conversations. Just everything that we do. What does it look like to do those very things <clears throat> with an eternal perspective? I think that's, that's the important thing. So uh, if you have a pen, take, take out a pen. You don't have to have a pen, but if you don't have one, just like pretend you do. So look at your pen, hold it up and look at it. I'm sure you've never seen a pen before. This is pretty profound. But seriously, um, let's look at this for a second and so this is our life. The, the little point where you write, that's the beginning of your life. The end of the, of the pen, just pretend, again, it goes on forever. So if you're holding up this way, it goes on whichever direction forever. And I know that's really hard to comprehend, but 
goes way out the door, way out, you know, it just doesn't end. So when James is talking about our life being just a vapor, that means that that tiny little ball on the end is your life. I mean, that's, it's not like you don't know that. But when you think about it in terms of like a visual, like, okay, this thing goes on forever, and that tiny little ball is this life, and most of the decisions that I make, at least for me, I'm speaking of myself, most of the decisions I make are thinking in terms of that tiny ball. They have no eternal significance. They have little grounding in, you know, how it's going to affect people, <clears throat> how it's going to advance God's kingdom, you know, all those things. Again, you know, these, these natural things aren't bad. But what does it look like? I just am posing the question, what does it look like to make decisions based on that? The long, forever thing. You know, it says in Matthew, it says it this way, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? That's that little ball. You get everything you want. You never have any problems. You get everything that you want, the way you want when you want. That's our culture, right? Have it your way, right? There, there used to be a, one of those cash checking services. It was like, or no, I, I forget what it was. Some, some commercial that's my money. I want it now. And they said it like over and over. Like, that's obnoxious. But that is our culture. That is our culture. So what, again, what does it look like to step out of that perspective? To not try to gain the whole world, and at the expense of all the other. And when we, when we, um, I think that the more we become spiritual beings, you know, it talks about uh, Paul talks about the the natural man. The things of the spirit are like foolishness to the natural man because the natural man cannot perceive. The things of the spirit because they're spiritually discerned, right? The more we become spirit, the more we realize the natural world around us is not as real as the spiritual because this is temporary. It's like plastic. It's like Barbie world. And the more we become spirit-minded and spiritual beings living as spirit, the more we realize we're not from this earth anymore. We are other than creation. My friend John Thomas, I love it, he's always saying like, why do we act so human? Because we have the sperma of God, the seed, the Greek sperma, in us. So we are other than beings. But yet we get so caught up in the here and the now. Um, I want to talk about tactics because I think this is really relevant to this point we're hitting. Because perspective is everything. What we see is Satan and God both have tactics. I guess that's the best word I can come up with. Um, ways to influence us, right? And one of the tactics of Satan is to distract us, right? Distraction is one of his big... I mean, he's got many, a list of ways that he can attack us and do all these things, whatever. But distraction is probably the biggest. And I think for many Christians that are distracted, he doesn't really have to mess with distracted Christians because they're distracted. They're not really doing him a whole lot of harm, you know? And so, you know, we get distracted with the meaningless, the, again, the ballpoint, the little, the little tiny things that seem so important, so significant right now, and in, in eternity we will be like, what in the world was I concerned about that for? Like, who cares? So, you know, distraction comes in the form of 
material things, but it also comes in the form of pointing out our, our past, our guilts, our shames, our condemn, condemning us for the things that we've done, all of those things. Those are all distractions. But again, when we are connected to the Father, we're connected to, we're already connected to eternity. So then Jesus has these tactics as well. Um, let's see, Galatians 6. No, actually, let's, let's step back and we'll do Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. You can just write it down. You can revisit it later. I'll just read it for you. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 11. How many of you know that verse? Very well quoted verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, to give you hope in the future, and all those things. So, do you notice a correlation between Satan's tactics and God's tactics? They both have to do with thinking. Our battle most of the time is right here. It's not the obstacle in front of us. It's our perspective about the obstacle in front of us. It's not, the, it's not just the sickness that we're dealing with. It's our perspective about the sickness that we're dealing with and the hope we have or don't have in the midst of that. It's not the, the relationship that we're dealing with. It's the perspective about the relationship. And I, you know, you can fill in the blank. So Satan's tactics is strongholds, wrong thinking. He's planting seeds of thought in us to get us in these thought patterns that they're like circling, you know, what do they call it when the airplane doesn't land but just holding pattern? That's what I was trying to think of. It's just like thought holding patterns. We're getting absolutely nowhere but he gets us in these holding patterns of wrong thinking. Um, similarly, just like we read in Philippians, you know, God has a tactic too, right thinking. Whatever is good, noble, pure, good repute, all these things, think on those things. And then Galatians kind of hammers it home, 6-7, it says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, he will reap. So again, in this perspective of a vapor, our ballpoint of a life here on earth, it's a sowing and reaping issue of the mind, the things that we're thinking, because We've gone, we've gone over this before. I'm going to do it again because it's, I think this is one of the most profound, important things about our Christian walk. Because if we understand this, it gets us out of so much behavior modification, sin management, guilt, shame, condemnation, these um, strongholds that keep us in these holding patterns. If we can get this right, we would do well. And so you can turn to your other sheet and look at the mystery of choice. Because, you know, we're talking about what we do with this life, what we do with this life. But we'll see something really interesting here. Number one, you can just put thoughts. And again, we've been over this before, but I, I don't think you can say this enough. It's so important. Romans 12, 2, Paul gives us a principle that is active and at play here, and it's regarding the area of thinking. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this mystery of choice is found in that very scripture. 
because he says be transformed, which the Greek there is metamorpho, which means is where we get the word metamorphosis. Well, when you look at metamorphosis, it's a, uh, you have a worm, right? Cocoon. You don't like worms? Okay, it's fine. A butterfly. You don't like butterflies? Okay, that's too bad. I don't like worms, but I like butterflies. So you have this worm, caterpillar, whatever you want to call it, turning into a, an actually different, new, transformed, transfigured. When Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, I believe, you can look this up to check whether I'm right, I believe it's the same word, metamorpho, in the Greek. So we're talking about, we, we become metamorphosed by the renewing of our mind. So number one is thoughts. We renew our mind because what we think about, number two, becomes our actions. You cannot think something ongoing over and over and over and not eventually act upon it. It will influence the way you behave. It will influence the, way, the choices that you make. It will, you will act on it soon enough. And so then our actions, once you do an action long enough, then number three, it becomes habits, right? So you ingrain a habit. Number four, it, your habits, the, what you do on a regular basis shapes your character. And then number five is your destiny. Your character determines, it, it's like your character is the ceiling for your destiny. All of that goes back to thinking. So how does this pertain to what we're talking about? Perspective. It's all about perspective, the, the right thinking. And so we have this ballpoint pen of a life on earth that we spend thinking in the natural so much about things that only affect that when we've got an eternity of things, important things, that Again, as we become spirit, we realize the spirit realm is more real than the natural. This is just a shadow of the things to come, of things that, that really are already. So we get, when we understand this principle, we find that everything starts to change because we, we, we find ourselves on eternal ground. So there's your PowerPoint that I didn't give you. So then the question remains, what does it look like? If we think on eternal ground, if we stop thinking about the ballpoint and start thinking about the thing that goes on and on and on forever, which we are already connected to through Christ, how would our lives look different? I know mine would look different. And it's a process. You know, a lot of times we want to want to just like bust through and be instantly different, but there's always a maturation process. You know, there are no mature births in the natural and there are no mature births in the spirit. We start out as a baby and we grow. So that should be encouraging because we don't have to have all the right answers. We don't have to be the changed, immediately changed different person but we do have to recognize that in our relationship with Christ is the ability to change because there's nothing good in us. But as we spend time with him, we become like him and he starts to show through and then less of us starts to show through. Um, and we start to be conformed to the image of Christ, which Paul talks about a lot. But again, a lot of that, that happens through the renewing of the mind. It's the perspective, the thoughts, the thinking that we do. So hopefully this can get us out of that sin management, you know, workspace, like I gotta just do the right thing or stop doing the right thing. Interesting, the last thing that 
James says here in, in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. We often think of sin as doing things that are wrong. We don't usually think of sin, sin in terms of not doing the things we should do. That's also sin. Interesting. But we don't know what to do unless we are in relationship and intimacy with Christ because it's through that relationship that He reveals the way we should go, the way we should think, what we should do in this moment. A couple chapters back in James, you might remember we talked about the law of liberty, the mirror, right? A man who looks at himself in the mirror and walks away and immediately forgets who he was. So that law of liberty being the word, Christ and the written word, is not about do's and don'ts because it's a law of liberty because we're not bound anymore by the do's and don'ts, the black and white of scripture. We're bound to a relationship with the one who tells us what we should and shouldn't do. So again, it's, it's thinking correctly in this relationship. It's not about don't do this or do this. It's about relationship with Him, and we become that. And He tells us what we should and shouldn't do. And so, we can unplug from striving for a bit, and plug into relationship. And it's easy, because it's relationship. We're meant for it. We're made for it. All of creation is made in relationship. The atomic bond, what holds the chair together that you're not falling into a heap, a puddle on the ground is the relationship of two atoms to each other. Everything is relationship. God himself is three relating to each other as one. It's relationship. And so it, even in the fabric of his creation, we see this pattern, this model. He's showing us like He's like, oh, well, if I didn't show you this way, let me show you this way. Well, if, if you don't get that, then how about this? He's trying to, like, get a point across to us that relationship is important, both with him and with others. And, you know, I think um, because of the performance mentality, the focus on do's and don'ts, I believe that because we have, how do I say this? How many of you have heard of the cheap grace thing? Which is basically like, essentially, well, just do it anyway, grace covered it. Right? Licentiousness. I think we fell into that as a church because we got worn out from the do's and don'ts. We were living by the law, and we can't fulfill the law, and so we're like, well, let's just kind of cut the car a little bit. Like, we can, that's okay, grace covers it. And we got worn out, so we're like, well, maybe we just lax the law a little bit because grace covers it, because we can't actually do the law. But if you look at the words of Jesus, he actually made the law harder. He said, oh, you, you see it written that you shouldn't uh, commit adultery. Oh, well, I tell you, you actually shouldn't even look in lust. So you should not just do the, not do the action, you shouldn't even have the thought of doing the action. That's not cheap grace. That's, he raised the bar. But again, it's, he understands something that you cannot do the law, I fulfilled the law for you, so come to me, because spending time with me will create a different you that doesn't think those thoughts anymore. And so therefore doesn't do those things anymore. See, again, it, this all ties back to thinking and relationship. Those are the most important things. So if you don't get anything else from tonight, hopefully you get relationship is important. And you don't get relationship through coming to church. You don't get relationship through doing right things, being a good person. You get relationship through relationship. And, you know,
know, I know a lot of people that um, they're a Christian or basically they live vicariously through their pastor or their parent or someone that is a good Christian. It's like, well, I know them. But it's like, no, you're missing the point. You could go to church every day of your life and you don't know him. Jesus said, many will come to me and say, didn't we do these things in your name? And they'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because that's the point, to know him. So, relationship. You know, we need to, when people come to this church, we need to be teaching them how to have a relationship because that's what's important. How do you do that? I don't know. I'm learning. But that's important. So that's what we're striving for. Um, and that's why prayer is a huge, prayer and worship is a huge thing of what we do because I can stand here and tell you all the right answers, but that's not going to do anyone any good unless it's the Holy Spirit convicting you through your relationship with Him and applying those things to what you're doing, you know, where you're at in your life. And so relationship and thinking, man, you battle right here. Right here. 99% of our battles. And it took me hitting a low, low place to figure that out. Actually, Cal, those of you that don't know Cal, Cal and I played college baseball together. And so Cal knows old Kyle very well. And literally, um, I played two years of college baseball, um, helped out one year, and then the second year I went, I was planning to help out with the team. Um, and long story short, a lot of you have heard kind of some of this testimony anyway, but um, I entered into like the dark night of the soul. The hardest time in my life, by far, ever. Um, and it took me, you know, the physical sickness I was dealing with. I couldn't do anything. I, I missed classes for like at least a week. Um, just doctors and fear and anxiety and just depression and all kinds of stuff I was dealing with. Um, and through that journey, I learned a lot of things. A lot. It was like the Lord put me in a spiritual blender. <laughs> It's like, boom, I'm going to do all these things at once. Um, but I learned that a lot of my battle was up here. I had so much wrong thinking. Um, so much wrong thinking. And in some cases, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> like, it's not that I didn't know that Christ was the answer, but until I got put in that terrible situation, finally I realized, oh, I need to be thinking like about God a lot more instead of just like, um, adding him to my life, he needs to be my life. And it was in that point that I realized that's where it's at. And my mind immediately started to be renewed and drove me into scripture and drove me into prayer and a lifestyle of prayer and worship that I literally cannot take credit for because had he not done that work in me, I don't know where I would be. But it wouldn't be good. I had my own plans and none of them happened. Thank the Lord. So anyway, I'll quit rambling. But I'll leave you with your meditation point and your challenge point. So this next week, um, ask the Lord to reveal what your life would look like if you were fully given over to the spirit and internal ground thinking. Not this ballpoint, but the internal. And so, you know, literally this is a meditation point because it's a point of meditation. Take some time and you may be surprised what you see. It could be incredibly profound when the Lord gives you a picture of what prophetically because prophecy is speaking that which is not as though it is, right? So when he gives you a picture like that, all of a sudden he shows you a picture of, oh, this is not now, but that is going to be. So let him speak to you and show you like what, what going to the grocery store looks like 
when you're doing it with eternal ground thinking in the spirit. That can be a very profound exercise. And then the challenge to you is to take uh, five minutes each day this week and pray. Just pray and ask the Lord. You know, we just read that says, you have not because you ask not. Wow, well, that's pretty simple. So we want to think differently. We need to ask for him to help us to think differently. We really can do pretty much nothing in our own strength. So just ask and spend five, I mean, five minutes a day. You can do five minutes a day. Set a reminder on your phone. So um, this, this coming week, just kind of a, I don't know, this is really nothing that you need to know, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because it's fun. And maybe for some of you, you'll feel led to do the same thing. But uh, for, the, for the next month, I'm planning to put three reminders on my phone to just like give me a quick little alert at uh, three repeating times throughout the day, every day. Um, I've heard it called the daily office. There's other names for it. But basically, it's just a reminder that like in the middle of whatever I'm doing, driving, brushing my teeth, eating, you know, mowing the lawn, anything, that goes off, and it's like a check to say, like, where are you at right now? Am I in the spirit or am I in the natural? I've done it in the past, and I find myself I'm like, oh wow, I'm like, I'm on the ballpoint right now. Like, I'm not in the spirit at all. But the cool thing is, it really helps you. You get into a habit of checking yourself, and then when it becomes a habit, all of a sudden you'll be mowing the lawn. You'll be like, oh. Oh, yeah, I need to get in the spirit. And so we, we connect to the Lord, and everything is way more fun that way, let me tell you. Um, so, yeah, there's another challenge for you. Consider something like that. It can, can be good.